Hey everybody, what's going on? It's Lee Kwai Lao here today, and we have a special guest on the LFAM Streamers Podcast. I am super excited to talk about this individual who has become a friend over time. And if you haven't seen him, you have to check out, check out Steve Wushu on Instagram because being at an elite level in Wushu takes a lot of discipline, both mentally and physically. It's not something you could do overnight. It's something you have to achieve over time. And it's just amazing to be able to do, be doing this interview. Um, I want to say thank you to Sneak Energy. This, this podcast is brought to you by SneakEnergy.com. Check it out. It's an amazing product. And without further more, I am so honored. And again, Ami Tofu, I appreciate you being here. Mr. Steve Wushu himself is in the building. How are you? Oh, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm just, I'm stoked, you know, because I love martial arts and your story is perfect for me to do because growing up doing it all my life, fighting injury and seeing you at an elite level today is amazing. How, how do you do it? First of all, um, I would say it's, it's understanding balance more than anything. Um, when we learn to do martial arts or any sport or any physical discipline like that, we only focus on the hard work and the effort and the training. But actually what we need to do as well is focus on the recovery um, and looking after the body um, and making sure that for all the effort that you put into training, you're putting the same amount back into recovery. Certainly, as you get older, your body takes a hell of a hit from training. So you've got to find ways that work for you to avoid injury, um, recover from injury, and make sure you can just keep going with it all the time. Um, over the years, I've seen so many people retire from training, from martial arts, from competition, in my opinion, way before their peak, way, way, way before they should Agree. retire. And it's nearly always, 99% of the time, because of injury, uh, because they train so hard and they don't take the time to learn how to recover or the best methods by which to um, save their body so they can keep going. And having seen all of these things, I just, I constantly educate myself and take it on board and learn new creative ways to make sure I can still keep training and still keep competing it's understanding your body um every year that it gets older um how you can make it better and stronger for the next year i i you know if for those of you that haven't seen his training videos or what he does at steve wushu on instagram you guys can see it firsthand from his weapon art forms to his forms in general and even some of his stretching exercises and you're going to you're going to notice right away like hands down like wow this is an elite athlete at your level to do what you have to do it it takes an elite athlete because you have to have the flexibility and the strength and attendance um and to see that you're still as physically fit as as you were in your early stages is incredible and it's it's a it's an amazing thing to understand as an athlete because um I think far too often athletes Sometimes we'll push a weight room regiment over a stretching regiment. Um, and so I, hands down, I, I have to 100% agree. You're, you know, and thank you for sharing. Um, Everybody, including myself, is anxious to know what caused little Steve, going back in time, to find an interest in martial arts. How did it start? Where was the, the flame ignited? I have to know. <laughs> it was it was a very very long time ago uh 30 35 36 years ago something like that so a long time ago um back in the 80s the early mid 80s um i grew up with my older brother watching 1980s movies and we all know what martial arts movies were like in the 1980s we're talking early jackie chan movies yeah um you know, we were just getting into Jean-Claude Van Damme in the mid to late 80s. Um, the first martial arts film I watched was No Retreat, No Surrender, which by today's standards is not a great film. I did actually <laughs> watch it recently and think, oh, my word. But 
when I was that young, seeing people flying around, doing all of those kicks and jump kicks and everything, um, the ghost of Bruce Lee and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and the guy that I watched it with at the time was my best friend. I had no idea that he was into martial arts. Um, and he showed me his karate belts and his karate gi and everything. And I was like, wow, <laughs> this is awesome. This is insane. Um, and I ended up joining his karate club at such a young age. And that's, right. where, that's where the practice of martial arts actually began formally, I would say. Um, if you discount standing in the playground, trying to do spinning back kicks on your best mate, um, really having no idea what you're doing and clocking him in the head. Um, so That's a good friend. <laughs> he, was, oh, he was a great friend. He's still my friend today, funnily enough. I don't know why. Um, but it was, his name is Sean Eady. He was uh, my, uh, my best friend as a kid. And it was him that got me into formal martial arts training. But I would say the, init the initial inspiration was definitely my older brother. Because my older brother, Andrew, he's half Chinese. Um, he was born and raised in Hong Kong in the 70s. Oh, wow. And he was already practicing Kung Fu out there. So, of course, as I grew up, um, I was witnessing him um, do Kung Fu, watching Kung Fu movies, and then getting that sort of um, Eastern culture, Kung Fu vibe thing going on at a very, very early age. And, of course, there was nowhere else and nobody else around me at that time um, exposing me to that. So I would say that my very, very early martial arts exposure, the thing that really sparked it off, uh, was definitely because of my older brother, Andrew. Um, and then obviously it grew from that sort of formal training that I started with my best mate around the same time as well. Wow. See, and, and that's always awesome. If you have a, if you have a sibling, obviously siblings, when si one sibling does something, another one wants to kind of try it, maybe follow it. Um, or they just don't have an interest. Uh, in this case, it was definitely, hey, I want to do and learn that. Uh, I know the feeling. I'm right there with you that the 80s era of, of Kung Fu flicks on VHS was amazing. It was. It was just like, wow, you know, I mean, gosh, from all the different Taekwondo video of uh, martial art movies to the Kung Fu movies. I mean, let's just name it. And then, of course, John Claude Van Damme comes through with like, like all these crazy blood sport and all this stuff. Like it just was like, Oh my God, cyborg was like a big deal, right? Cyborg is basically like, we're kind of living in that today because you know, it, it, it's kind of funny because a lot of the video games you see uh, from like borderlands or cyberpunk, like I'm like, that's cyborg, you know, that's like, you know, exactly, yeah. the movie was ahead of its time. And if you watch a lot of these Kung Fu flicks or future conflict, Kung Fu movies that were like back then were in the future. Um, it's kind of funny to see how video games have played out that, but to mm. also it was like amazing birth to anime and yeah. anime sparked the interest again in martial arts that, uh, when it fades out, it always seems like it comes back. Power Rangers sparked the interest in martial arts. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, but what people don't realize, you know, when you're seeing them do these chore choreography things and stuff like that, the people behind the scenes, the actors aren't or no, always, aren't always normally the ones doing it. It's the stunt man. It's the other actors behind the scenes in the costumes mm -hmm. that are doing the, the, the actual work. Um, sure. And in your case, you went from being a sibling, knowing and learning something new to going it, into it competitively. Yeah. How did that happen? That transition where you said, okay, I'm going to go to that next level. Yeah. I never knew that I was going to be a competitor. I never knew that I had um, a competitive streak in me. I just I didn't know that existed. Um, the the most amount of competition I really did um, initially that I can remember was playing soccer, football, as we call it over here, for uh, my school team at the time. But as I started in, because uh, I started in Shotokan Karate, that was the first thing I ever okay. started. Okay. And my sensei at the time um, obviously saw something and put me into competition straight away. Um, you'll see on my Instagram uh, profile recently, I think a couple of months ago, I finally found my first karate competitions. Um, so I posted those videos on my Instagram, um, uh, on my Instagram profile. And 
I yeah, I think my very first competition, I either won or got um, second place. But that also sparked an interest. I was like, wow, I absolutely love this feeling of getting up, doing this kata um, in front of all these people. Um, I just, I think it's a performance streak that I had. I think that's what it was. And then obviously, if you're rewarded for doing that, right. by, you know, winning first, second, third or whatever, that just encourages you as a child to want to do it more. And henceforth, everything um, sort of grew from there in that sense as a, as a competitive athlete. And from that day on, right to this very moment, I've always been a competitive athlete, uh, not just in martial arts, but then in everything else that I've done as well. Right. Now, when you, you, you said your, so your first art was actually a form of karate. Yes. And then after that, how did Wushu find its way into your life? And what age were you when you made that tr transition? Because a lot of people don't realize Obviously, either when you're doing martial arts, some, some children will just stick with one art. I found, and a lot of it was because of Bruce Lee. Mm -hmm. Bruce Lee, and listening to his philosophy and things like that, um, I found early on that, you know, you got to try every art. You got to learn something. You know, everything has its weaknesses and strengths. If you want to have different counters or, or different moves, learn different arts. Keep your mind open. Mm -hmm. And he, at a young age for me, it was like, I want to learn more, you know, like, yeah. and, and what, what happened? What transpired you to go from just karate to a different form? And was it, was it Wushu right away or was it something in between there before you got to Wushu? Um, interestingly, um, I think I got to about the age of 12. I think it was about 12. Um, just completed my first and black belt, junior black belt in karate. Um, I'd also won at the Junior National Karate Championships. So I'd already reached a high level in karate. Um, and I'd seen what sort of lies beyond as well. Um, as far as being a competitive karate um, athlete um, would be. But at that time, I was also seeing other martial arts. So as I got older and I started to uh, go to the library and um, bear in mind, we had no internet. Back then, no so talking the early what was 90s, internet? 90s, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, my the in terms of literature and resources, uh, the best I had was my local library. Um, and uh, what we have a, a bookstore here called WH Smith's, um, which back then was the largest one of the largest bookstores. So, I used to go in there and order books on different martial arts boxing, kickboxing, kung fu, um, and I started basically searching the world as best I could for different types of martial arts, something to pique my interest. Um, around about the same time, uh, my neighbor, I had a new neighbor join the, uh, the housing estate, and he owned a Chinese takeaway just up the road from me. And he just moved here from Hong Kong. And he used to practice Kung Fu when he was in the army in Hong Kong. And he brought with him uh, video CDs VCDs. Yes. Um, oh my gosh. I'd never. I had no idea they even existed back then. And he, he <laughs> yeah. showed me these laser discs and VCDs yeah. of different styles of kung fu. And I distinctly remember seeing this um, video CD called "This Is Kung Fu," which was filmed in the late seventies, early eighties, I believe, and it showed wushu, all of wushu in China, all the different styles, all the different athletes. It showed me a young Jet Li. I didn't even know who he was at the time. And all of the, uh, the great Wushu champions of that era. And I was just like, what is this? It's beautiful. What is this? It's, it's what I see in the movies. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is incredible. What is this? Uh, and of course, uh, Simon, his name was Simon Tang. He explained what Kung Fu, what Wushu is. Um, he had a whole library of books and everything. And that really started me on the path to Chinese martial arts. Um, I read books on Taoism, uh, Confucianism. Um, he had a copy of the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, which I read, which was absolutely transforming for me in much the same capacity that you were saying. Yeah. It, it teaches you so much about um, having an open mind, learning different martial arts styles, absorbing everything, throwing away the uselessness. Um, and it, it really set me on a journey. And I think for my early teens, maybe 13, 14, um, going into 15, 
I was searching around for other Chinese martial arts, uh, different types of Kung Fu, Choi Le Foot, uh, Wing Chun, uh, Lao Ga, Praying Mantis, different styles of Shaolin. Um, and I was learning a lot of these mostly through videos that I could find and books that I could buy to read. Um, I was starting to get to the age where I could start traveling to London as well, um, where in Chinatown they had a lot more of these resources for me to Oh get yeah. So the, my early mid-teens was a very, very um, transforming period because I, I learned so much about different martial arts. And I found, finally found a book called Wushu. I didn't, have, I didn't have an idea of what it was, really. And it was a book that was printed in the same year that I was born, 1981, <laughs> decades ago. Um, and it was um, made by Donnie Yen's mum. Bosin Mark. Okay. Um, some of your listeners might be um, familiar with the book. And it's basically a yellow A4 softback book. And it's one of the earliest English printed um, books that you can buy on Wushu. It describes what Wushu is, where it came from. Um, and it has a lot of pictures of a young Donnie Yen doing Wushu in the United States. Um, and again, I was just like, I've got to learn this. I absolutely have to learn this. Unfortunately, that book had some basic instructional um, methods in there, basic training, basic conditioning, stretching and that sort of thing. So I started following those straight away um, and then started to buy more Wushu specific books. So I was like, right, I know now sort of filtered through all the martial arts that I've seen and learned bits from. I found my focus in Wushu, um, and it wasn't until I was about uh, 16 when I could um, frequently go to London by myself um, and start training with a Wushu team in London, and that's wow. because I started competing at open competitions around the country. Right. I, I was competing in these open martial arts competitions in very crude Wushu forms that I'd learned from books and videos. Um, some of which I will probably never post online because <laughs> it's incredibly bad. Um, but I started competing at these open competitions with these very, very crude, self-taught wushu forms. But it also gave me exposure to actual wushu teams right. around the country. And this is how I found my very first wushu club, which is where Ray Park used to train in London. Yep. Wow. And that's how that connection was initially made. We're talking ooh, 1996, 97, so sort of the end of Ray's Wushu career. Yep. Um, so I joined this London club, um, and that then really was the start of the major Wushu uh, journey. That's where, where I went from there. Things developed quite quickly after that. Once I'd really found my focus and got grounded in that. Wow. See, that's that's incredible. And and. The fact that you were so young and so determined, okay, to to just get a child to read a book is one thing, right? To keep a focus day in and day out is a whole nother level. And I could totally transpire with the books. I have a bookshelf in the room next to me that I keep a majority of my books, you know, and including my G Kudo book, it's right there. You know, who doesn't, yeah, I tell people, if you love martial arts, you have that book. <laughs> like yeah, you, that is book is, it is, it, it's, it's, it's so I tell everybody that is like the MMA Holy Bible, right? Mm -hmm. Mixed martial arts. Like that's, that is it. Um, he defined a lot of odds and he, he pissed off a lot of people because yeah. why are you teaching our each East Eastern culture to the West? And I, I even remember in the 80s, it was still very touchy. And mm -hmm. people don't realize that. I remember that, how touchy it was. Um, but again, incredible to be so young and have that mindset day in and day out to study just basically from pictures and written words on how to yep. do something. Um, it's not easy, especially Wushu. I mean, Wushu is a lot of movement. Uh, you know, it's, I want to say it's more pro pro right side you know definitely right sided dominant you know because sure. from what my experience and uh you know it but for me like you when i saw it when i first saw it i was like 
oh my god like like i i love the movement i love the forms i it just it was just like the, the fluency was just like how do i move like that i want to i want to learn that um and it was amazing to me from the other martial arts on how i could see some of the influence being like almost weaved inside of wushu mm-hmm. and it was just like wow this is amazing um uh so somebody personal to me one of my sifus um you know master chan his 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 teacher was a 33rd generation monk from shaolin northern style pray mantis and that's mm-hmm. his strong form and like you training the wushu students to go on to do better things like film and stunts and things like that or competing um such as yourself when you went on to competing and you started doing the tournaments around london and stuff um when did you find that okay wushu is now my my form this is my life this is what this is what i want to do this is what i want to do to get to a olympic level this is what i wanted to do to become you know my club personally because obviously wushu stole your heart from then on yeah and when did you start competing at that elite level when you knew i'm ready yeah um so obviously when we when we're sort of mid teenagers 15 16 17 years old um there's a lot of pressure on us um at home and at school uh, and culturally to start deciding who we're going to become as adults what direction in life we're going to take are we going to continue education are we going to go to college um and major in sports or law or something we 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 all we are all pressured to have a direction um i had it in my mind that i was going to do one of two things i was either going to join the armed forces as an officer um and follow in the footsteps of my family um or i was going to do wushu um and take it to the highest level i can and at the time it was a 50/50 split and i think the reason that i chose wushu is because i was given a almost like a scholarship package so there was a, a a a group of people in my hometown which is not a very big town um and they're called the kettering old grammar school foundation very very british institution but what they do is they fund local uh people local teenagers and children to pursue activities that they couldn't otherwise pursue because of financial difficulties. Oh that's brilliant. So I didn't come from a money background at all. So for me to pursue something like wushu, right? It only costs money. It's like it's money all the time as an amateur athlete. So I applied to them just in the hope that maybe I could get some sort of sponsorship maybe to train for uh, pay for the hall that I train in. or pay for my travel to London or something. I could only imagine these scholars sitting there saying, "What is this wushu?" <laughs> <laughs> exactly like that. Exactly like that. Um, but I think because because of what I'd done and what I've achieved to that date, to that point in time, um they were willing to give me a chance. So they offered me initially a 3-year scholarship package. um i think it was around 3 or 4000 pounds per year plus all of my competition expenses which i was to me that was like a full time wage a full time salary uh, and that was really the uh, the deciding factor because to join the armed forces in england uh, you can do that sort of any time up to your late 20s so i thought look if wushu doesn't work out i've still got plenty of time to go and do that career that right. i was going to do So I chose wushu. I moved to London at the age of 17 and uh wow. decided to train full time in wushu uh and become the next Ray Park. That's how I had it in my mind. You're just Because a kid. You're was, just a I kid. I was literally just a kid. I I didn't I didn't know what was going to happen. I just had this sort of tunnel vision. Um I wasn't even interested in movies or working in movies. I wasn't even, wasn't even interested in working. I was just interested <laughs> in being a wushu athlete and i'd seen um what ray had achieved um he was something of legend in london especially in this club you know from where he trained right. was like ray this and ray that and he was national champion and european champion and and i was like wow okay i've got to beat this guy i can't because he's retired but i've got to beat <laughs> this guy this be- this became my mission he's going to know my name 
exactly. <laughs> I, exact, that's exactly what I was thinking. I was like, one day, Ray Park will know who I am. Yes. Um, so I'm like this 17-year-old kid. I've just been given this, uh, this scholarship to chase my dream. So that, that's exactly what I did. I was like, right, the military thing, the armed forces, that can wait. Time to go to London. I moved to London. Um, I shared a flat with uh, my school mate who was at university in London. Um, and that's it. I just went for it. And I totally went for it. And it was only a matter of time then before I won the national championships. Um, I also traveled around the world um, a lot to Malaysia, to the same place that Ray used to train in Malaysia. Uh, we had the same grandmaster, Master Teng, in Malaysia. We both studied the same traditional Kung Fu, which is uh, Shaolin Chin Wu, Northern Shaolin Chin Wu. Yep. So a lot of people will know what the, the Chin Wu school is. We both studied that and we both did the same style of wushu, uh, the same forms, the same competitions. Um, we even wore the same colored uniforms for competition. Um, and it was my absolute mission was to win all of the national championships, win the European championships um, and basically sort of take over from where he left off. That's phenomenal. Yeah. And, and uh, just so this crowd, everybody knows all the viewers, Ray does know who he is. <laughs> Cause I, I, you know, I, I met Ray a while back and, and you know, Ray, me and Ray ended up talking about you, but it was just funny how we just got done talking about how the martial arts level at, a, at when you start to get up there, it's such a small circle. Mm. Um, especially when you start to get with special teachers that are in special forms or schools, clubs, and they train with each other and they share each other's, um, history so that way it goes on you know it's 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 a legacy mm. i tell people all the time martial arts to true martial artists it isn't about fame and fortune it's about the heart and spirit and the love for it it's, yeah. a, it's a guide through life and even after life it's something very very special um but yeah you definitely have done that um but now that 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 makes total sense but man what a way to spark a fire in a 17-year-old teenager to move to a city that you don't know anybody really. I had no friends. <laughs> and to chase your dream. Yeah. I mean, yeah. did did I say mom over here, but over there you guys say mom, right? Yeah, mom. Yeah. Did mom say you're you're crazy, Steve? Or <laughs> yeah. everybody. Everybody did, yeah. Yeah. But you know. Here's a perfect example, and this is why I wanted to share this story to the world. We do insp inspirational podcasts with the LFAM Streamers Podcast. You guys can learn more at LeeQuaiLao.com um, or the LFAM Streamer Podcast. Uh, and if you want to capture the video, watch the video afterwards. We'll have the video up on YouTube as well. You can also watch them uh, at LeeQuaiLao.com. But this is a perfect inspirational story of somebody who had a dream that was so far out of reach financially and country-wise, okay, that you literally chased it through books, through a vision and inspiration from somebody who laid a foundation by the name of Ray Park to spark a fire and continue it so that you could get to the level that you got to. This is, this does, it doesn't happen. I mean, if I had to say how many times it happened, to somebody in the real world at your level and to keep going 30 years down the road, it's a rarity. And people don't know how rare you're, you're, you are in the martial arts world. It's a rarity. Um, so I thought it was important that we share your story because you're not just any typical martial artist. You're part of a legacy that has built a legend behind itself. And people don't realize that. You may not see yourself as a legend, no, but the truth is, you actually kind of are, and you're an, even a bigger inspiration now, I'm sure of it, to the younger generation over in London. And those scholars that may have passed now because you're older and they're no longer here, I could promise you they're looking down saying, we made a fine choice. You know, I even though so. they didn't know what Wushu was, I'm sure they <laughs> had their tea and they were talking like, what is this Wushu? And, and when they funded it, I mean, they're looking down now saying it was a wise choice. And um, what, a, what a drive. I mean, wow. That's a drive. Um, it's, um, it, 
you're absolutely right when you say that it has to be something that it, it, it goes so deep that it touches the soul, that it becomes a part of you. Because if it doesn't, you're very um, quick to get rid of it. it become, it's something you do rather than something you become. And to have that sort of passion for such a long time, it really has to um, be something very, very special about, you know, it's, it's in your DNA. Um, I think when you start something like that so young, when you're um, at a young age where you're, the blueprint for your uh, life is developing and everything that's influencing you at that time um, is out there, that's when whatever you're exposed to is going to stay with you your whole life. So at that young age, when you're exposed to something like martial arts, the chances are you are going to stick with that in some capacity for your whole life. Um, and quite interestingly, this year, 2020, we've all had a terrible year with the <laughs> COVID situation. Um, this has been the first year in 25 years that I have not competed in my wow. arts. The first year in 25 years. And I've trained probably less than six less than six weeks in total for the whole year with my coach, which has been absolutely um, incredibly bad. And what it's taught me is um, that wushu and the routine of training and the lifestyle and the focus it is so important to me as a person and my life in general that without it, everything tends to fall away. I've noticed over the course of this year that um, I've been less focused, less determined, um, less enthusiastic about everything in general. And not because I'm bored or lazy or tired or anything like that, but simply because the the real substance of who I am has been reduced Correct. through through means other than my own fault because I can't go and train with my coach and my team and I have no competition to set my focus to. Although I've managed to train by myself and do some training in the gym when the gyms have been open, it's been nothing like it has been for the last 25, 30 years. This is a very unique situation this year and that has really really shown me the value the importance of what wushu is to me it's not just a physical pursuit no it really is everything that makes up who i am as a person and that is probably the main reason why i will never retire although i will change as i get older what i do how i compete how i train that will change, obviously, as I get older, as right. it has done since I was younger to now. But you adapt. But you adapt, exactly. Right. But the most important thing is it will never leave. It will never go. It will always be the main thing that drives me from minute to minute and day to day and year to year. Um, I, I totally see that in you. Um, you know, the amazing thing, again, going going back to – how you adapt with the 2020 we we've talked with a couple athletes already on the show and even if everybody who does something but athletes in general who have to go to facilities to facilitate these activities in front of large crowds and judges and travel i mean you are in constant contact with people on a day-to-day -day basis uh you know and it, that had to have been horrendous to just automatically hit the brakes. Um, and for some people, you, uh, some people it can affect them with depression or anxiety, or they could just feel a sense of loss. Uh, mm. You know, and uh, we talked about this before early on before we started the podcast about how amazing it would be if the world could have wushu or any form of martial arts in elementary school at an early age. Mm, and how it mm. gives you that concentration, that focus. Um, and this is a perfect example on how it given you so much along the way. But to recognize it now and, and know that, you know, even in 2020, 2020, I can't stop. I can't change. I can't just give up hope of what I am and what, what I've built. 
this is my foundation. This is my roots. And I'm going to keep it strong. I'm going to keep nourishing it. Going into 2021, where do you see your martial arts going, your training? How do you see this upcoming year? Do you, are they going to go back to doing competitions this coming year? Um, what the, have they talked yeah, about? The, the plan generally around the world, certainly in Europe, is really to try and bring these competitions back. In Wushu, we've seen a lot of online competitions. Um, I personally haven't competed in any of the online competitions. Um, I think that's just really a personal choice. My coach and my teammates um, all agree on that as well. Um, we very much like to do our competitions at the venue in person, real time, um, rather than doing those online. That might be something that continues um, into next year. But I do know that um, a lot of planned and cancelled competitions from this year are going to try and go ahead for next year. Um, particularly, the World Wushu Championships is meant to be in Dallas in around October, November next year. So I haven't competed in the United States since 2002. Wow. Um, so I did the World Chin Wu Championships in Dallas, Texas uh, in 2002, uh, which I won. I won six gold medals at that competition. And that was the last time that I competed in the United States. Wow. So to go back to there yeah. in 2021 in Dallas as well for the World Wushu Championships is a, a very important competition for me. So I'm really hoping that it does go ahead. And at the moment, you know, all... All signs are indicating that it will. But of course, none of us really know what's going to happen in that capacity next year. Whether, you know, the United States has travel restrictions, whether Great Britain has travel restrictions, um, that remains to be seen. All that I can do is really focus on what I have control of myself. So going into the new year, um, I will be doing a lot more training at home. Um, the gyms are quite readily available now, again, in England, so a lot more training in the gym. Focusing on developing my physical ability, um, right. where I can't train wushu in a competition sense. So a lot of stretching, a lot of conditioning, a lot of foundation building. You can never build enough foundation, especially as you get older. So next year, I'm going to be 40 years old. For people to compete in Wushu at 40 is unheard of. It is. But for me to do that, I relish that challenge. And I see it as uh, an opportunity to, to really work hard on my physical ability to offset injury, to prevent it from happening, but still maintaining that um, high level of physical and technical ability. In order to do that, I have to do the groundwork. I have to do the ugly training as it's <laughs> get in the gym at silly o'clock in the morning, um, work on my fitness, my cardio, my stretching, making sure my ankles, knees, my back, make sure they're all really strong and stable so that when I do go back to wushu training, I'm hitting the ground running and I'm ready for competition, you know. So yeah, my focus going into the new year is going to be largely on that, making sure that the machine that I've created is proficient and um, well-oiled and ready to go for Wushu training. Wow. That's my focus. It's, it's going to be a very interesting year. I, I really hope. I really hope it happens. Um, and if I'm lucky enough, if it comes to Dallas, let me know. I'll try to see if I yeah. can fly out there. I, I would love to see it in person. Obviously, I, I do not do it anymore. Too many injuries, too many knee surgeries. Um, again, to compete at this level at that age, unheard of, you have to be in a phenomenal shape. Injury normally does, does us in shoulders, knees, ankles, uh, even the hips for Ray. Um, you know, we all know he had, he had had to have hip surgery yeah. and a lot of that again, coming from wushu and tumbling. Um, it's a lot on the joints and. I've said it time and time again. If you haven't seen Steve Wushu's Instagram, again, at Steve Wushu, go there, look at it. Phenomenal shape. Any advice for anybody who's just older, needs to maintain a better physical diet or fitness? There's all these 
crazy things out there that they have, right? These crazy, like I call them over the top diets. You know, like if you do this diet or pop this pill, you're going to be healed. I, let's face it. That's not it. What's the simplest advice for somebody who's getting older and wants to stay in physical shape? What, what is the main couple things you would tell them to do? Just so we give a little bit of health advice from somebody who's competing at 40 years old at an elite Olympic gold medal level, guys. He didn't share this with us. So get, get your pen and paper out and write it down. <laughs> so um, absolutely, as you get older, you, you quite rightly say, um, taking care of the body is the most important thing. Um, you can still train and learn technical things and skill things, but you've got to be very aware of what your body is capable of doing. And the harder you push the skill things, the more your body is going to fight back with injuries and things like that. Um, the two most important things I would say for anybody at any age, but especially as you get over the age of 30, when you start getting over the age of 40, drink more water and stretch more. Because these two things are the foundations for your body to be mobile um, and to be um, pliable and uh, comfortable. Most injuries come from inflexibility. I do agree some injuries come from over flexibility and lack of strength, but that usually comes a little bit later. That's something you have to include as you take training a little bit more seriously. But for 99% of people out there, you're not flexible enough. Nope. You're not flexible enough. And you will be trying to do a jump kick or a B-twist um, or something, you know, and your body will be fighting against you because of inflexibility. Maybe you want to kick up there, but you can't because your hips are too stiff or your adductors are too tight or your back is too stiff. If you're trying to do the skillful stuff, or the cool stuff that you know people like doing nowadays, like with tricking and XMA and all that kind of thing. If you're not flexible enough, you are definitely going to get an injury. And it's yep. only a matter of time before those injuries compound into major injuries. You will tear something, ACLs, um, Achilles, tendons, something like that. And then it's game over. Yes. Unless you're so determined to rehabilitate and come back. And some people I know have done, especially my teammate, Sam, um, he did his ACL in competition in 2010 um, at 17 years old. Um, but within about three or four years of rehabilitation, he came back stronger and he's a much stronger athlete. But he was very hungry for it. So that really facilitated his his uh, recovery. But for most people, when you get those sort of injuries, it's game over. So avoid it from happening by stretching more. and. You could go on and on and on about different types of stretching, different methods of stretching. Basically, if you're not stretching, find a way to stretch. Find a way. Yeah. Hey, people um, should do it right when they get out of bed. Um, yes. Right? I mean, it's, it's different for different people. You know? <laughs> Some people find that that's the best way for them to stretch. Some people need um, a workout so that they're warmed up enough to, to stretch. Um, at the end of the day, the most important thing is stretch. Stretch. More. <laughs> Make it a priority because I'll, from experience, up until about the age of 30, thereabouts, uh, you could pretty much do anything from cold and not get too many injuries, if any, at all. Same thing goes for like what you eat in your late teens, early 20s, mid 20s. You could pretty much eat whatever you want and it will have no effect on your body, assuming that you're training, that is. You get to the age of 30, thereabouts and definitely beyond. If you even so much as look at a, a, a burger, or a Big Mac, <laughs> eat a burger or, and go go tumble, or fried chicken or whatever, you know, <laughs> you will start putting weight on. And the same goes for um, physical disciplines and training. Right, that sort of age of thirty, your body is more susceptible to building muscle rather than stretching muscle. So you will find you get stronger as you get older, but you will definitely become more rigid. Tendons, ligaments, they tend to start to tighten up um and you know certain parts of the body feel like they're fusing together so it's yes. really really important to push the stretching even more 
So for me now at my age, stretching is the number one most important thing that I do because without it, it's a highway to injury, guaranteed. And then that could be ending, career ending. Yeah, that's it. You know, I mean, now if I get a serious injury at my age, that is it. There's not going to be any coming back to competition no. at the same level I'm at. Um, um, knowing that is enough motivation for me to do all of the right things that I can do to prevent that from happening. From standing on a BOSU ball with one leg, with a blindfold on, with different weighted kettlebells in each hand, just to make sure my knees and my ankles are strong enough to take the impact of wushu training. Wow. But above all of that, absolutely stretching. If you're unsure where to start with stretching, go to a yoga class. Go to a yoga class. Do it for six months. Um, learn to do the splits. Because yoga is a very good, active, gentle, um, functional way to become flexible. It doesn't matter if it, you know, it has nothing to do with martial arts, but what it does for the body is it frees everything up so that your martial arts becomes easier and your training becomes safer. Right. Um, and then you can explore other areas of stretching, different ways of stretching. Um, but yeah, stretching and drink more water. For sure. There you have it. From somebody who competes at an elite level, okay, and is a gold medalist in, in, in their category, a legend in, in Wushu. Yeah. Water stretching will change your life. It's that simple. It's it's funny how something has simplicity, but yet we make it so complex. <laughs> yeah, but if you if you read Bruce Lee's Tao of Jeet Kune Do, simplicity the quickest point between two point uh, the quickest time between two points is a straight line. Straight line. Keep it is so simple. true. Always reduce it to simplicity. That's it. It's a beautiful way to put it. A world of knowledge inside that head, and um, I just want to say, like, it's been a phenomenal. We're we're definitely gonna be doing a some more um future podcasts with Steve and his journey because he has so much to give. He has so much knowledge out there. Uh, we didn't even get into the competition status and what goes on at these competitions and things like that. Um, because I know there's a lot of martial artists out there especially in Wushu that would like to have the little bits of, of knowledge here and there. Um, and if you don't mind, we'd love to follow you on this journey. And even if you go to that uh, uh, Wushu, uh, you know, tournament in Dallas, um, we would love, love to have you on before it. Um, and maybe even afterwards, um, yeah, I'd be honored. Pleasure. Absolutely. Um, uh, real quick, before we get off, if you had to say, Traveling around the world and learning wushu from different teachers and stuff like that. What is your most memorable experience up until now in your life as an athlete that you will always cherish when it comes to your martial arts? Is What is the most memorable thing that comes to mind? And I know it's a tough question because you've done a lot. It's a tough question. <laughs> but if you had to put something there, I'm just curious. Because you've seen so much and you traveled so many places. People don't realize you traveled, what, gosh, Korea, like all over. Yeah. I mean, a lot of places. Seven different countries in the last uh, 20 years. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Um, what is a memorable moment at an event or something that you will cherish that has been through your career to now? Mm. I think um, winning my first European championships um, in my mid thirties is something that has never been done. Um, and a very important goal for me in Wushu. Um, when I started in Wushu, when I started training in London, uh, everybody obviously was always on about Ray Park. Uh, and I had so much respect for Ray for being a European Wushu champion. And it was, it was one of my most important goals to become a European champion. And even though I've um, competed in world championships, I've even won the Chin Wu World Championships, uh, which is a, a, a Wushu competition, but not the official world Wushu championships. Right. Um, the real main goal for me was to equal what Ray has done in Wushu. 
uh, a win a gold medal at the European Championships. Once I'd got over the age of my 20s, I thought that would never happen. I was really starting to think, that's it. it it's not going to happen. If it was going to happen, it was going to be in my prime in my 20s. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen. I had to wait until my mid-30s. I had to wait that, that long before that finally happened. And it was, it was a moment that I envisaged in my mind for the two or three years leading up to that competition. I would drive to training thinking about it, feeling it, imagining what it was like to stand on the podium, to hear the Great Britain National Anthem, um, to see my coach's reaction, to see my teammates' reaction. I really like thought long and hard about it. I tried to make it a reality. Right. And in 2014, I made it a reality. Um, and I became the first European Wushu champion in, in that event since Ray Park in the mid-90s. How awesome is that? Um, and for me, that was really, really important. It was so significant. Um, it was a, obviously it was a, a team effort. You know, my coach had as much to do with it as I did. Um, my coach, by the way, is Mike Donishu, who was also Ray Park's teammate on the Great Britain Wushu team in the mid nineties. Wow. So they actually knew each other very well. Um, but it was Mike's coaching, um, together with my determination and training that made that a reality. So for me, that was the most significant thing, most significant memory of all the things that I've done, of all the places that I've been, um, the teams that I've trained with, the countries that I've been to. Um, that for me, because it, cause, because it carries so much weight in, uh, in my life from a, from a much younger age where it all began. So I'm hoping that there's going to be something more significant in the future, <laughs> but we'll I, see. Oh, I, I, what a perfect way to come back from a 2020 year of holding, holding the brakes, right? Of basically the, the, the world, right? And, and then all of a sudden to come back 2021 where you won it once before in Dallas and to win it again would be an amazing part of your journey i i strongly believe you could do it your mindset's incredible to know that you you never gave up on your dream and you envisionalize that you put out that they, they say if you truly believe in what you are chasing in life and you could envision it they say you, scholars have said this now even at cambridge all right if you could envision it you could you could change it you could change that outcome of your future and you know what? You, you did. You did it. And I could only imagine the hype and the emotions as you stood on top of there, that podium, listening to the Great Britain National Anthem. Well, that's just, it gave me chills. It gave me goosebumps because, I mean, incredible. And uh, definitely got to give you applause for that because that is not an easy Pass when you're competing with so many elite athletes at that level to get there um incredible thank you and uh i want to thank you you know for coming on and 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 sharing it sharing him one of his most memorable moments guys we do this in real time we don't cut and edit we don't edit our videos because the emotion everything is real um i'm lee kwai lao i want people to understand what we do and what you do and and know the emotion is real and there's nothing to hide here but true inspirational stories of amazing in individuals, talent individuals that are just like you and me who pay the wave. And now you guys out there can hear these stories of ins inspiration and follow these individ individuals like st at Steve Wushu on his Instagram and have that passion and desire and know age is just a number. But the gift and determina determination of keeping it inside your heart and soul is priceless. Absolutely priceless. And um, I want to thank you for coming on today. Uh, I'm looking forward to us having more of these conversations in the future. I see it happening sooner than later. Some people would say, oh, it, it, you know, maybe down the road, um, we'll do another one. I'm doing another interview with you. We're going to do a couple because I want to know more. I want to know more and uh, maybe next time uh, I'll even take some 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 of that footage of 
hopefully that Dallas competition, if it happens. And we'll show people on our YouTube and everything and part of your video what you do. Um, it's been a pleasure having you here today. And uh, cheers, mate. Yes. Cheers, mate. Thank you very much. <laughs> Everybody, this is Steve Wushu at Steve Wushu Instagram.com. If you haven't followed his Instagram, drop him a follow. Where can they see some of your other videos? Do you have a, a YouTube as yeah. well? If you YouTube Steve Wushu, um, I've put loads of competition videos up there dating right back to 2001. So I've, um, I'm in the process of basically uploading all of my competition Wushu videos that I have over the last 20, 25 years. It takes time because there's a lot of competition videos. So absolutely, head, head to Steve Wushu on, uh, on YouTube you'll start to see all of the competition stuff up there. Perfect. You heard it. Steve Wushu, YouTube. Get it. Check it out. If you're a young lad that wants to try this out, guys, believe in yourself. You could do it. And it's going to... Trust me. When you do martial arts and you play a sport, I could promise you, when I played football, which is soccer, I should call it football, obviously, soccer, my soccer was on point because of my wushu and my martial arts. People could not, I would do things on the field or hit certain kicks midair that I could rotate my body and do things that people couldn't do. True, it very true. is amazing what it does to your sports game, including my jumping, you know, on a basketball court. So um, martial arts goes a long way. So again, I wanna thank you for coming on with us, Steve. Thank you so much, bless you and your family. Bless you on your journey. I'm looking forward to seeing more of you in your tournaments. Thank you very much. Have a happy Christmas and a great new year. Thank you.